This guy is revisiting the scene of his own murder. This is the actual grave site. In these shocking photos, he looks very much deceased, but in fact, he was faking his death. When I look at these photos, that still brings back a lot of horrifying memories. Ramon Sosa and his wife Maria ran a gym outside Houston. They even appeared together in this TV commercial. But then the marriage hit the skids. Imagine his surprise when he found out that Maria had hired a hitman to do away with him. The killer turned out to be an undercover cop pulling an elaborate sting. Police took Ramon to a shallow grave they had dug in a remote location. A makeup artist made him look like he had just been assassinated. Look at these incredibly realistic photos. The bullet hole in the head, the blood running down his face, all fake. They also put my hands like if, I, like if it was handcuffed or I had him tied behind my back. Later, the undercover cop secretly recorded the meeting at which he showed Maria the images. Look at the smile on her face. She looked like she had just won the lotto. Maria was also recorded handing over the first installment of $14,000 for the killing. The evidence was so overwhelming, she pled guilty to solicitation of murder and got 20 years. When I saw the photo of my dad in the grave, it was shocking. It was scary. You know that it's fake, but you know, it could have been real. Now Ramon Sosa is in a strange situation. One of the few people on planet Earth to ever walk on his own grave. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. I'm alive. Yeah. I'm alive. I'm alive. Uh, uh, first of all, let me thank Mike for giving me the opportunity to be out here with you all. Uh, I've been out here in London for about three days now, enjoying the city. I've been to Heathrow and coming on, uh, to Europe a few times with my boxing career, but I never gotten to visit. Uh, like I did now. It was very beautiful. I loved all the sights and had a great time. Going home tomorrow. Uh, back home is probably about 6 in the morning, so I'm still, you know, still trying to get used to the time. But uh, I'm here to talk about my story, a uh, very interesting story, and how we got to that picture right there. Tomorrow, July 23rd, 2015, makes exactly three days, I mean, excuse me, three years since then. Now my ex-wife uh, was arrested in my gym, in our business, for solicitation to murder for hire. These are things that you see on TV. I, I've never met anybody that this happened to, or I've never seen anything like this. And it was the last thing I would ever expect in, in a marriage. Uh, I don't know here, but in America, 50% of marriages end up in divorce for whatever reason, most of it is, is the money, or infidelity, uh, we had our problems, but uh, it was just a simple divorce. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little background where I come from. Uh, I was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and the reason I'm saying that, because Puerto Rico is a commonwealth of the United States, and that makes me an American citizen, and that comes into play in our relationship. Uh, I started boxing at a very, very young age. Uh, I was about seven or eight years old. My father was a wrestler, he was a professional wrestler, and he used to take me to the gym on Saturdays, me and my brother. Um, I have two sisters and a brother. Me and my brother would go to the gym, and he would always tell us to, you know, work out and stuff. So I ended up with the boxing side of the, uh, of the gym, and I enjoyed it. If you don't mind, I'm going to start walking around a little bit. because I feel Anyway, um, I started boxing at a very young age, uh, competed over 150-something uh, boxing matches in the amateurs. I fought in the 1984 Olympic trials, Western trials, to try to make the Olympic team in the United States. I didn't make the team. I turned pro at 17. Still in high school. Uh, boxing was my life. was what kept me out of trouble. Uh, to me, it was something that I loved, something that I, that I looked forward to doing. After school, all I did was my, it was my education and boxing. So boxing has been very, very something that I, it's been clean, near to my, you know, close to my heart and that I love. Uh, at 17, when I turned pro, it wasn't, it, as a professional, things change. It's a business then. And to me, I had, you know, I moved back to Puerto Rico uh, with a boxing contract. And it, not, it did not work out because 
as a professional boxer, I feel like I was like a, you being used like a property. You know, you're only as good as your last fight. And there was a lot of stuff going on. And I said, you know what, this is not for me. My promoter, uh, my manager and all that stuff. I said, you know what, this is something that I don't enjoy anymore. Like when I was a kid, I used to love traveling. I used to love the competition. I used to love, I would, you know, just the blood, sweat, and tear of the boxing for a trophy and medal. Now for the money, it was different. Uh, it didn't feel the same, but I always loved boxing and I loved everything that had to do with it. So I went back to Texas. I moved, that's where I live in Houston, Texas. We moved to Texas with my family after living in the East Coast in several cities. And I continued boxing, but this, from now, I was in the training part of it. I started training kids, I tried to train adults, but in the year 2000, that's uh, after being married for about 10 years, we, you know, my first wife and I divorced. We were young, three kids, marriage didn't work out. Uh, so I decided, you know, this is not gonna work out. This is going on ways, but I never stopped being a parent. I have three kids, Mitchell, my oldest is 27. Then I have Chris, is 24, and then my daughter, Mia, is 20, the one y'all saw right there. It's, it's, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous, but it just means a lot to me, you know? This is something that happened that is still very dear to me. Uh, so my wife, you know, first wife and I did not work out. She was young. Things went, we, didn't, we went our own separate ways. But one thing that I never stopped was being a parent. I never stopped being a dad to my kids. Uh, boxing again came back to my life. I opened up a, 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 a nonprofit organization named Young Prospect Boxing to help kids, at risk kids. Uh, I had a lot of kids that were overweight, kids that had problems at home, kids that were being bullied, kids that were in gangs, kids that were just from all types. And these are boys and girls, not just boys, boys and girls that I had. Uh, I traveled the nation with these kids. It's something that was that I loved. From it reminded me of my, when I was a, a young amateur boxer, and I wanted to give back to the community. This particular day, a young man walks in my gym. He's about twenty something years old. We'll call him Mundo. That's not his real name because he doesn't want to be called by his real name. His nickname is Mundo. He a little bit overweight. He just came up to, you know, like most of the kids that come to the gym, he was a little nervous, and he was like, you know, I don't know about this, but he wanted to box. So he walked up to me and said, hey, coach, you know, I'm not here to compete. I just want to know how to box. I like the sport of boxing ever since I was a young man. My father never took me to a boxing, all, you know, like I wanted to. I said, no, you know, I'll train you. The first thing I did was, you know, is help him how to lose weight. And he loved that. He lost in like in three months. I don't know how you compare it. Uh, it's, it, was, it was by close to 80 pounds. So his whole life just changed. He went from an oversized young man to completely different. And one of the things about this young man was he was the next gang member. He had recently been let out of jail. He had, he showed me all his tattoos. He was shot at, stabbed, uh, and one of the things that he wanted that he didn't have was a father figure. And I became his father figure. He became close to my family. He became close to my kids. Uh, I would bring him around the house. I would teach him manners. I would teach him a lot of things that he didn't get at home growing up. And I think that's what got him in, the, in trouble with, with the gangs. Uh, Mundo was very, 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 still to this day, very close person to me in my heart. Uh, so fast forward now to the year uh, 2007. Uh, I moved from the area where I used to live in Houston to another area of town, and I opened up uh, my still have my, have my young prospects, and Mundo's still my, helping me with the kids. One particular evening, this evening it was something like this. I walk into a uh, restaurant. It's a Mexican restaurant that in the evening turns into a uh, kind of like a nightclub, and they play Latin music. Uh, they play salsa music. I mean, Puerto Rican. I, you know, I still got a little bit. <laughs> um, at that, I was about 
40, my early 40s. And I walk in, the place is packed. And I see this lady dancing with this man that wasn't very attracted to me. And I was like, how did he get so lucky, you know? <laughs> so, you know, men, like we all mostly know, we're very visual. We're very, very visual. So I see this lady, I'm like, wow, she's beautiful. Bringing the real tight black dress, four-inch heels, and just very captivated, captivating. So I just kept, you know, I say, man, I got to talk to her. So I got to find my way to her. I didn't, you know, all I saw was a bunch of men, you know, like most of us trying to talk to her. Everybody was just trying to surround her. And I didn't pay much attention. Later on that evening, she walks by me. And with a four-inch heel, she steps on my toe. <laughs> I went down in pain. I was like, oh, my goodness, I cannot stand the pain. And she was telling me, please, please, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What can I do for you? Here, I'll get you, whatever, get you a drink, whatever. And I said, nah, can we just dance? And that's where it all started. We danced in that way. And that evening, we talked and talked and danced and danced. Uh, and I felt like the luckiest man in the room because she picked me to dance the whole night. And afterwards, when we were about to leave, uh, she said, so what are you doing now? I said, you know, I'm like, whoa, <laughs> get lucky tonight. <laughs> and I said, okay, uh, well, you know, I'm living, I live kind of, well, you know, about 45 minutes from here, but, you know, I had a couple few drinks. And I'm just going to take my time and go home. She goes, no, 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 you had too much to drink. Just, why don't you go home? Go to my home, go to my place. And I say, thank you, God. <laughs> so I think I was going to get lucky. I'm going, you know, you know, the man thing. So we get to the to the uh, to her place, and she goes to the front door. And she goes, "You have to be real quiet. My son is upstairs sleeping, and my daughter's in my bed." And I said, "What about me?" She goes, "You're gonna sleep on the couch." <laughs> <laughs> so, long story short, you know, I slept on the couch. Nothing happened, but she was. I thought that was at least very nice of her. Let me sleep in her in her in her place. Next morning, I wake up. She makes me breakfast. We talk some more. And one of the things that really she wanted me to let, to let me know that she had a young man, a, a young son that was probably about 12 years old. He had been in a lot of trouble. He just very, they, he didn't have a father, basically. And, and, and it was very, very hard for her to control him. Uh, Lulu is from Mexico City. She had been in Houston when I met her for about a year, year and a half. And uh, she traveled by car with her two young kids on a visitor's visa. Uh, she worked underground, what they call underground, because you know, legally in the United States you cannot work with a, with a visitor's visa. So what she was doing was cleaning houses and working little odd jobs just to make ends meet to you know, make it for her and her kids. And I, and I admired that about her, saying, you know, knowing that, well, she came to this country, you know, which is not easy, uh, and she's doing whatever it takes to make it work for her kids. Uh, although her son was, you know, having some problems, and, and me, you know, having a lot of having a uh, a lot of uh, experience working with young men and young ladies and you know kids that have a lot of problems like those what, she, what he was going through. I tried to talk to him. Uh, I, you know, we we became kind of close, but he always had this little thing that you know you're getting too close to my mom. You know, it's one of those say. Hey, you can talk to me, but I don't get clean. And I understood that. But as, as we dated, we started dating more and more. We, I mean, we came more, the, we, I became more close to them uh, to the point where in 2007, or no, excuse me, 2009, I proposed to her. Uh, we have, I had met her family. They, they were back and forth from Mexico City. I had, they, she had met my family. She had met my kids. So we became, so we ended up getting married. Uh, it was a small celebration, not big. You know, went to the courthouse and then we had a, a family gathering. She didn't want nothing big. Number one, she didn't want nothing big. Right after we got married, uh, the week after, she didn't want a honeymoon. She said, "No, we, you know, I don't want to spend on that mo money on the money on the honeymoon. I'm sorry, just just save the money. I need papers. I need I need to be you know I need to be here legally." 
I said, oh, yeah, you know, what? it was, we got married on, a, I think it was a Saturday. That Monday or Tuesday, she was already applying for her American papers to become an American citizen. I actually was a resident. They give you a green card first for the first three years, I believe. So I said, no problem. You know, I understand that it is difficult because every, every six months, she had to go back to, well, on a visitor's visa, she had to go back to Mexico to the border to get uh, another extension to her visa so she can stay longer. And, she, you know, as soon as she, she got married to me, the point I'm trying to make is being an American citizen from Puerto Rico, that was it. You know, she said that the same week she became, uh, you know, she applied uh, a few months later. She got her, she got a green card, what they call back then, back in the States. It's a green card. She became a resident. Let me tell you that this lady, to me, at the beginning, we were talking about massages. She would get up early in the morning, make me breakfast, lunch. I would get home from work, and she'd be dressed up like beautiful. Uh, she was just a very, very, very attractive lady that just knew how to treat me. Uh, she loved, she can walk into this room and she, you know, she, she, wanted to be, she wanted to be known that she was walking in this room. She was that type of person, or was. And, and that's what she liked. She liked attention. Uh, about a year and a half later, we opened up a business, Woodlands Boxing and, and Fitness, which was a big boxing gym. Uh, it was something that, was in, that, that I wanted to do for a long time. I had my own gym, big gym, and, and she was a big help. She, she, her background was uh, being a masseuse, and, and, and she worked uh, in, back in Mexico City. She worked for the Ford Company as an executive uh, secretary. So she was good with numbers, and she was good with being clerical and all that stuff. So that's what she did a lot for the gym. And I took care of all the, of the rest. I was the trainer. I was everything else. So as far as the office work, she did everything, and she helped me train. She learned how to become a trainer for me. And we grew that business in less than three years to make, we were making about $18,000 or $20,000 a month in less than three years. For a boxing gym, that's pretty good. Uh, that's pretty good money. And we were doing very well. We bought a big home. We had toys, we had motorcycles, we had cars. We had everything we wanted as far as money. Lulu loved to dress well. Uh, that was her, her, her nickname, Lulu. Uh, Lulu loved to dress well. Uh, she, she would go to the mall every weekend. She would come home with bags full of everything you can think of. Clothes, shoes, everything. She would come home and you know, buy me stuff. And I, you know, I never went shopping because she always bought, you know, everything I, you know, everything I needed, she bought it for me, you know. But it was obviously from the business. Uh, we had a great time. We used to travel, went to Mexico, went to Puerto Rico, uh, vacation. Everything was great. Uh, after the third year, she applied for her American citizenship, and that's when things started getting kind of hard at home. Uh, we were having problems with the kids. The young man was always, actually older now. He was having problems in school. He didn't want to go to school. He was doing bad in school with the grades. The young lady, too, was following the same footsteps. Uh, and one thing that I noticed was that Lulu was having a hard time with my kids coming to my home, where our home. She didn't get along with my kids. It was starting this little jealousy between her kids and my kids. Uh, I, and I believe that it was because my kids did well. My kids, like I said earlier, I, I, was, I was always being a father to my kids, and their mother's always been doing well for them. My kids graduated, went to college. They all had good jobs. Uh, they did well. Her kids were having problems. You know, and and I, don't, I don't blame her. I don't blame you know, the system. It was just something that the kids didn't want to do because I, t I used to have so many talks with them, explain to them that you're here in the, in the United States of America, where so many kids would love to be here and have the same opportunity you have, and you ruin it for yourself. You know, doing anything, you know, and I tried and, you know, do homework with them, and take them here, take them there to try to get them help. You know, so I, you know I took them to counseling, uh, then I work. Uh, the young man one time, 
he got arrested in school for some substance that he had, and he did some time in juvenile hall, and that really hurt Lulu. She was very, very hurt because of that. But we tried to work our problems out. Uh, I came home one day, one afternoon, and I see American flags all over my house. And they're all dressed. I said, what's going on here? She said, I just became an American citizen. I have just as much rights as you do. She had gone to the celebration to become an American citizen and didn't invite me at all. She said, and I said, well, what? You mean to tell me you didn't, you know, you had, this is very special to you, but you became an American citizen because of me, and now you didn't even, did not even invite me? She goes, oh, no, I didn't think you wanted to go. It was something that was very simple and everything, but I said, okay. Her mother became an American citizen. Her kids became an American citizen. She became an American citizen. I said, okay. You know, we had our differences. That's when we started going our kind of little separate ways. We had our little difficulties. We took a trip to Puerto Rico. That's when, you know, to visit my mother and father one summer. And Lulu already was, she didn't want to go. She was said like, you know what, what are you going, she had, in her mind, she had this thing that I was going to Puerto Rico to invest in buying some, uh, an apartment that I was telling her that I wanted, I wanted to buy a home back in Puerto Rico. And, I, and that's what she thought. And she said, what are you going to Puerto Rico for? You know, what can we invest in Mexico? I said, well, my parents live in Puerto Rico. I'm from Puerto Rico. I want to have a home there too. So that's where it all started. Uh, being Puerto Rico, we had, we had something, something that happened that it was brought up later. Uh, the last, Lulu had this thing about knowing what buttons to push to get me started or to get me to engage in arguments. And she knew how much I loved my kids, especially my daughter. She was to me, and still to me, one of the most precious things. And she would make little comments about my daughter. My daughter, my daughter was a model. She was, she was crowned in San Antonio as a teenager. And she was, she, uh, and, and, my, and Lulu always, you know, had this thing against my daughter. And my daughter competed in, in, pa in uh, little passions and stuff, but she, going back to Lulu, she always had this thing that she knew was buttons, what buttons to push. And this one evening before we took our trip back to Houston, she seemed at a comment like, what does your daughter wear those kind of clothes? She looks like a prostitute. I'm like, she's only 15 years old. This young lady's only 15 years old. Why do you, why you have to make comments like that? So confrontation starts talking, you know, we're talk, you know, kind of back and forth, back and forth. Uh, she left, she came back, you know, she called, uh, she, she thought she was gonna, you know, get me in trouble with the security, calling by calling them. Uh, I remember in the room, she had her phone, she was trying to call my mother, and I told her, why do you have to call my mother? You know, this is, I'm a grown man. If you have a problem, you know, talk to me. She grabbed the phone out of, out of, I grabbed the phone out of her hands, and so she used the phone in the room to call my mother. Long story short, she, we were separated. The, the security came, she was put in one room and I stayed in the other room. We remember, went back home the next morning, but it was very difficult. That's, that's the situation that happened. In the year uh, 2013, after a year, I just couldn't take it anymore. It was just to the point where we couldn't talk to each other anymore. Things were getting bad at the gym. We were living at each other where we just couldn't, we just was not gonna work. Uh, she applied for divorce uh, in 2015. I knew things were hard at home. I just couldn't take it anymore. We were living like enemies. She was living upstairs and I was living downstairs. Uh, things were, gonna, were not gonna work out. We tried counseling. We tried going uh, with the kids, family counseling, but it's not, it just wasn't gonna work. Uh, Lulu, to me, already had a plan. And I used to bring it up to her you know, in many, many conversations. I said, if you came to this country for a reason, you came, it seems like you came here for the American dream, and you got it quick. You became an American citizen, 
you got a big home, you're making good money, and now that you have all that, I'm not worth it. I'm just, you know, you don't need me anymore. And she would always reply, look at me, look at my body, look at me. I can get any man I want. I can get any man I want, but I chose you because I love you. What does it mean? Like, <laughs> That's how she was. She knew exactly what to say, how to manipulate you, and how to keep you always thinking, like, wow. You know, uh, it was very difficult living at home. It was kind of like living with the enemy. You know, we there's so much tension in our home. Uh, I never forget the day I got the call from Mundo, and this is how it all started. Mundo, he already knew that me and me and Lulu were going through a divorce, and uh, he called me one evening. Or, yeah, one, no, one morning, I'm sorry, this in the morning. And he said, Pops, uh, this lady wants to kill you. And I was driving. I remember I was driving. I told, I said, Mundo, quit joking around because he likes to joke. I said, quit joking around. That's, not, that's nothing to joke around with. He said, Pops, I've seen that look on people's faces. She wants to kill you. So I pulled over. I mean, I've never heard that in my life, so I, didn't, I was just, you know, I didn't know what to do, what to, what to say. I was just enraged. I was worried. I was just so much tension, everything going through my mind. And I said, Mundo, what, did, what, how, what is going on? He goes, well, Pops, here's what happened. I was at the office. At the, because Jim, Mundo used to help me at the gym. And that evening, I had left early, and he said that, he walked into a conversation that Lulu was having with her daughter in my office of the gym. He said, Pops, I walked into the office and I heard Carla, which is her daughter. Carla was telling Lulu that one of the kids in the gym has a uncle in Mexico that chops up people and kills people. And I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, so I, when I walked in, I heard that I just kind of intervened and said, hey, who, you know, what are you talking about? Mundo said, he said that he told them, y'all need to be careful what you're talking about because you never know who's listening. And, they, and then they backed off. They didn't say anything else. Now, later that evening, Mundo walked up to Lulu and asked her, because he already knew what was going on with our divorce. He was going to be, we were already going through the process and Mundo asked Lulu, hey, uh, can I talk to you for a minute? Well, you know, earlier today in the office, were you guys talking, were you talking about Ramon? And she goes, yeah. He goes, what are you talking about? Well, Lulu said, I just wanted to go away. I wish the police would just take him, you know. I wish they'd just go away. And Mundo goes, go away like this? He did the pistol sign. You mean go away? And she goes, yeah, go away like that. Let me tell you, the decision this young man took is the reason I'm alive today. Right there, that instant second, he said, Pops, I told her I have the people that can do the job for you. That's what he told him. He said, Lulu, I have the people that can do the job for you. And she responded with, yes, we can talk. That's when he called me the next day. He called me and told me what was going on. And, and I said, well, what are we going to do, Mundo? He said, well, Pops. He just called me Pops. So he said, Pops, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try to record everything she says and see how far she's going. She, you know, we can go with this and see what happens. And surely enough, he would get a phone, you know, the regular cell phone, and put it in his pocket and started recording a lot of the conversations she was having with, with Lulu. Uh, I still get uh, very emotional to hear the words that Lulu was saying uh, in those recordings. Because when they were, after, they, after Mundo had met during the day or in the evening, whatever we were doing, he would, let me, he would call me over to his place and we would listen. Let me tell you, it was horrifying to listen. Well, still, she was still my wife then, 
to listen to the stuff that she was saying. She wanted me dead. And the reason she wanted me dead was basically for money. There was no reason, no other. It was all for the greed of money. She even mentioned on one of the uh, audios, she tells Mundo, Mundo, you guys have to do this as soon as possible. My divorce is going to be finalized in September. And if he doesn't die, his kids get everything. He doesn't have me in none of his pension, life insurance. I didn't have her anything. All that she had for me was this insurance, uh, medical insurance. She wanted everything. She knew how much I was worth that. She knew how much money I had in my pension. She knew, she knew how much money my insurance, my life insurance was going to pay. So she, that's what she wanted. And she told Mundo, I want him dead as soon as possible. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Mundo, this young man, had the idea of telling her, you know what, I got two guys that can do the job. Their name is Paco and John Boy, two street guys. Uh, we'll, do, you know, we'll talk to them and see what they, how they can do it, and I'll get back with you, how, how, you know, and let you know what they say. Mundo goes and talks to the supposedly hitmen and comes back to her and tells her that they want 12000 6000 apiece for my life. And they already have a gun, a dirty gun, and they want to. If you if if you want the hit, they need they need at least two hundred dollars right now to buy that gun, and they have it. Sure enough, Lulu Lulu agreed to all that. She agreed. I said, yeah, you know, I don't have all the money right now because at the time I was out of my home, I already had moved out. She said, Ramon has moved out of the house, but what I can do is give you part of the money, and when he dies, and when I get the pension. I'll pay you the rest. That was her plan. She didn't have all the money, so she gave him partial. And that's what all started. Mundo was started texting in front of her to Paco and John Boy. They're texting back and forth. And in the text, she's telling them, look, this is going to happen. I want him dead. I want him this. She, the whole thing was that she wanted this done as soon as possible. But one thing she didn't know, that the two men she was texting was me. <laughs> Mundo had bought a track phone with no phone number, you know, had it, and I had the other side, and I was texting back and forth with Mundo, making her believe that we were, that I was John Boy and Paco, and it worked. We got all the information, we took it to the police, and I said, I, that's when Mundo said, you know what, that's enough. We have the money, we have all the audio, we have text, let's do this, take it to the police. The police did the investigation, they brought the FBI, they brought the constables, they brought in uh, the agencies, and they said, this is, we, got, we need to do this fast. Once they found out that she wanted me dead, they had to go act fast. And they brought in an undercover officer, a Hispanic male, to play John Boy, and they would meet the same way. Under, you know, that's what you saw her right there in an undercover uh, vehicle. She had no idea the whole time. She even told in one of the audios the officer, "How should I cry?" She had no idea. She told Jumbo, "How should I cry when they call me and let me know that Ramon is dead?" She was practicing already how to cry. Incredible. This is the picture of me dead. And the way we came to the picture was we had enough evidence to have her arrested. Lulu, the officers, had enough evidence with everything that they had. But they came up to me and said, Ramon, we need something that makes this case a slam dunk. Lulu's a beautiful lady. She's never had no problem with, kid, with, with the law. And I'm afraid that if you go to, jury, to, a, to a jury trial, she might get one of these jurors to be uh, scared, you know, to give her any time. So what we're going to do, we're going to take you away, hide you for three days, and then we're going to take a picture of you in a tomb with a bullet hole in your head. And I'm thinking, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, what? Uh, uh, you want to take a picture of me dead? I said, wait a second, you, you have enough evidence. So 
they, they said, okay, I mean, we got to do it, we got to do it. We took them to the office, police station, and they have pictures of actual dead people. This is actually a copy of a person that was actually with a bullet head, and they picked that one and said, we're going to do this one, and then they brought two, two constables, and I'm thinking these guys are professionals. These guys learn how to do that on YouTube. <laughs> they learn how to do that on YouTube. Amazing. And I'm thinking, I'm, th I'm thinking, wow, these guys are professionals, you know. They learn how to do that on the fly on YouTube with materials that they, I don't know how they did it, but it was, they put me in a tomb, sure enough. They took me to the, they had a makeshift tomb and they put me in there. And they took pictures of me. I never forget my keep my that pose right there, my eyes closed, thinking about my kids, thinking about my daughter, my my son, my mom, what they wouldn't say when they see this. Next day, they go to my office, and they show no that the, the day that they showed Lulu this picture, she was so happy. She even asked the. John Boy, hey John Boy, is he dead? He's not getting up, right? He goes, mm -hmm, look at it. He's not getting up. And she started raising her hands like this, like she hit the lotto. She walked out of the, the car, and that was it. Next morning, the officers show up in my place and do a missing person report. Knowingly that the night before, she was laughing and happy about me being dead. They ask her why, well, you know, they have seen, she has seen me, and she asks, like, no, I'm looking for him, too. I call his mom. I call his friends. Nobody knows where he's at. She lied in front of her mother. Her, her, mother, was, her mother and daughter were there. The officer arrested her in my gym with clients in front of her. They took her, arrested her. Solicitation to first-degree capital murder. In the States, that is life in prison. After a year and a half, after a year and a half, she pleaded guilty to a second degree uh, solicitation of capital murder, and that's why she got 20 years. But this is the kicker here. About her being, after about a uh, few months in jail, she pulled out a black card. An officer shows up in my house, a female officer shows up to my house and said, Mr. Ramon Sosa, I'm serving you with papers from Lulu. She claimed that you raped her. This lady had that in her back pocket the whole time, claiming that I raped her, and that's so that was her claim. When, when, to have me, like, no, nah, this is what happened. No charges were ever charged. She, Lulu had filed so many false accusations on me. They all were investigated, that what happened in Puerto Rico. Everything was investigated, everything by police. Not one time was any charges filed on me. I'm alive today for one reason. And I say this, you know, God puts people in your path for a reason. And he put Mundo in my path. Uh, that young man, I owe my life to him. And I can honestly say that I'm probably the only man that has walked out of his tomb alive. Thank you. Thank you. My uncle um, was a, a doctor. He had his own clinic, he was quite rich. And at, at one point he married his secretary. And um, well, she was quite similar personality actually. This mixture of highly ambitious, narcissist, you know, very important how people perceive you and so on. And after some years, she went to Monaco with his, mo with his money and bought a contract killer to kill him. And the contract killer suddenly had a bad conscience. <laughs> <laughs> went to the police <laughs> and said, I, I feel really bad about this. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he still landed in jail for being a contract killer and having received the money wow. 
But uh, they arrested her. Of course, she says she has nothing to do with it. Um, but they found a notebook, handwritten notebook, where it was all planned out. So um, she also landed in jail. So um, another person being put in the path by God uh, to, yeah. So that's why he's still alive also. Yes, sir. Um, definitely the last question. Um, thank you for that really moving uh, story. Um, can I just ask, the bit at the end where you said where she uh, claimed that you raped her, what then happened? Did she do that to try and get her prison sentence uh, quashed? And did, did that work? Is she still in prison? Or, or? Yeah, it, she did try to use that as a, I guess, if put a, get a case on me. Uh, but uh, I immediately I told the officer, look, I, I will take a polygraph test. I wanted to take a polygraph test at the, at, right there on the spot. The same day, I talked to my attorney. We took a polygraph test. They did an investigation. And I remember exactly what she was talking about. No charges were fi uh, filed from the DA district attorney because he felt that there was no evidence in which, uh, to what she was saying. That especially when she already had so she already had filed so many false reports, police reports about me, that they were like, "Are you for real?" And then come to find out, I see pictures of all the files she had on me, and she had pictures of herself scratched in between her thighs, and she was using that against me. The trip to Puerto Rico, she has scratches on her, on, on, her, on her fingers to try to get used against me. She has so many notes and she has so many overwhelming evidence against her that she had no other choice. She had notes in her, in her own handwriting about things that she was wanting to do to me. It did not work. One last thing I'd like to say, if you, if you mind. Uh, I, my news has made worldwide uh, news from even here. I had a big story written here in one of the big newspapers here. Uh, I still get a lot of groups, I'm going to say feminists, but a lot of groups that feel that, you know, there's two sides to every story. You know, this lady's doing, she could have done life. She tried to kill me. She's doing 20. And I still get, sometimes I get mail and all our emails, or I get comments on my, a lot of the stuff on social media saying that there's something about you that we don't believe. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> because I'm a man, I'm, out, I'm, I'm, I'm just assumed that it was my fault, and I'm assumed guilty until proven innocent. Thank you.